Hi, I'm Daryl, and this is Board Gems, my weekly video series in which I talk about an older board game. This one this week uh, is not that old, about 2008, but it is by request. And it is The Hanging Gardens, which was designed by Dan Lee and published by Hans and Gluck in the late 2000s. Uh, it's for ages 8 and up. It takes about 45 minutes to play. That's pretty accurate. Uh, it's a nice family-friendly game. And the box says two to four players. Uh, you really want the, the lower end of the range for that. Uh, like Carcassonne, which is by the same publisher, uh, there's a set number of turns. And when you play with fewer players, then uh, each player has more turns, and so it's more interesting for them. When you Playing Hanging Gardens with four players is like playing Carcassonne with five players. It, you can do it, and it's the same game, but it's, you just don't have as much chance to do fun stuff. So let me show you how it plays, then I'll talk more about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board. I usually place the board on the side, but you can place it wherever is convenient. Each player gets one of these cards that just put face up. They're, they're the same back on both sides. The other cards show these icons. You'll see there's multiple, there's four different color icons, green, blue, yellow, and kind of a salmon. And this deck is gonna be shuffled up and placed on uh, its spot on the board here. And these are the scoring tiles. You'll see there's a number of different types of scoring tiles. Each scoring tile has a number on the corner, which is how many of that tile are in the game, and also how they score. This tiger, for example, will score four points if you have one of these tiles. If you were to have two tigers, the two together would give you nine points. So that's one example, but then you also have stuff like, I'll see if I can find it, this one, which gives you one point if you have one red tile, but 15 if you have two. So there's quite a variety, and of course there are tiles even that you get the most points if you get uh, four tiles. If you get more, then it's like starting a new set and it starts off at the, at the lower number again. So these are the tiles that you're trying to, to get. This is what's going to score you points. You shuffle up these tiles. There's a whole bunch, and you're going to place them. I mean, if you have a bag, you can use that, but there's also little spots on the board for it. And then you're going to reveal a number of tiles here. Now I should point out that some of these tiles are a little bit special. See, these ones, there's one of every kind. And this one says that if you have this and you do not have a complete set of tigers, you see it's the same color as the tigers, the orange, it'll score you three points. But if you have a complete set of tigers, this will score you 10. And these are lined up in three separate columns. And you'll see there's numbers three, four and five. I'll show you how that works later. And to start the game, you're going to flip over four of these cards. Each player also gets all the temples of a particular color. So there should be five of each color. And one player gets the starting token, which is this rose bush. So the goal of the game is to get these tiles. In order to get these tiles, you need to get these cards and add them to your play area. These icons alone do nothing, but if you can make sets of three or more next to each other and place a temple on them, you get to claim a tile. The start player is going to pick any of these cards and add it to their garden. So if, for example, they pick this one, you can place it anywhere and you can even overlap the table the only catch is that these icons must cover card. So you would not be able to do this, for example, because these are kind of overhanging. These icons have to be covered, uh, have to cover card. So you could do something like this, for example, or something like that. As long as the icons are on top of a card. Of course, later on, you get another card, you can cover up these spaces too. And in that way, the garden is going to grow kind of organically. 
Now these two spaces are next to each other. That alone doesn't do anything. Now let's say it's a two player game. Second player takes a card and they would also add it. Now this isn't directly helpful, but again, they can kind of expand their garden, you know, in some way, like so. And this gives them more options later. After the end of the round, then this start marker passes clockwise and you flip over another four cards. Now, when you add a card, what you're trying to do is to make groups of three or more. And then this card and this card already have a group of three, but of course you can also connect them to something else. So for example, this card, I could do something like this. You'll see, because these three spaces are covering these three spaces. After you make a group of three or more, you may, but you don't have to, take a temple and place it on one of those spaces. And when you do, you will gain a tile. What tile do you get? Well, if your group is size three, then you can take one of these two tiles, the ones in the three column. If it's size four, like this one, you can take any of the tiles in column four or three or anything less. In the case of a group of five, you can take any of these tiles, including these ones in the five column. And if it's six or more, you first draw a random tile, look at it, put it face down in front of you, and then you can choose which of these six you take. For example, I took this one, so I'm going to be collecting this one. I may take this one. And when you take a tile, it gets immediately replaced. They don't shift down like in some games. Instead, you just replace it as it is. Now, once a temple is on here, this does a couple things. For one thing, you can't directly score this again. Adding more yellow to this does not help, because this already has a temple. But there are still things you can do. Obviously, you can make other ones, and you cannot place a card covering a temple. That's not allowed. You can also do kind of funny things like this. And then later on, do this. This temple is now all by itself, that's fine. You just created a new group of two yellow. And then later on, of course, you could place another one like so and score this one separately, like that. So you can kind of do fun stuff like that. You always place a new temple, unless you have no temples left, then you move one. And when you move one, you always have to move the one that's on the smallest group, the smallest area. And in this case, this temple is now on a group of size one. So this could be one of the first temples you move once you have all these on the board. And then of course, it'll be the next round and you flip over four more. And you're going to keep doing this until the entire deck runs out. And then after the entire round, all the cards have been claimed, then the game ends and players will total up the values on all the tiles they've collected based on how many in a set they have. For example, right now, this is only worth four points. I have one tile in this set, which only gives me one, and this one, because I have an incomplete set, only gives me three. However, if I had a complete set of these and this, I would score 29 points. 20 for the three white tiles that I've collected, a complete set, and an extra nine for having a complete set of white. To score, you can use the back of the board. Let's have a look at the back of this board. I think the idea is you would then take two temples for each player on the zero spaces of both. And then as you score points, you move the, the markers up. Like, okay, I score nine points. Okay, I score uh, an additional six. So 10 and five, I have 15 now. I think that's the idea. It's very confusing to me. I would prefer the tens over here, but, um, it's it's wonky. I've gotten used to it because I've played the game so much, but and it is better to have it, I guess, than to just have a blank back to the board, but it does take some getting used to. Or you can just use a piece of paper. That's it. You're ready to play The Hanging Gardens. Hans im Gluck is one of my favorite publishers. 
and they're most famous, of course, for Carcassonne. Even though most of their games are aimed a little bit toward more toward the hobby market, uh, Carcassonne was a massive hit for them and still is today. And so you have a number of other games that came out in the decade or so since Carcassonne, in which Hans and Gluck also released like a bunch of family-friendly uh, board games, of which The Hanging Gardens is one. Um, I know that in North America this didn't really set the world on fire. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, Germany, for example, where the game uh, was published originally. Uh, but I can just say that it's a game that really worked for me and my family, and my wife in particular likes it quite a bit. If you're a hobbyist, don't expect a second coming from this game, okay? This is a nice, light, family-friendly game. Um, it might be a touch complicated to just to explain to like because you know sometimes I there's family friendly games and then there's games that you can play with like three generations right like kids can play with with grandparents um, I wouldn't put this in that category but it is very light uh, on BGG I think the weight rating is less than two which is a good indication it's kind of a light game like Carcassonne like Ticket to Ride for example um, works very nice as a couples game uh, it is, as I said at the top, it's best with two players. With three, it's fine as well. And with four, I'd probably choose something else. But I do like the game, and I will play it at all player counts. But it's like Carcassonne in that it has the same number of turns, regardless of how many people you play with. So if you're playing with two players, each player gets lots of turns, and there's more opportunity to, to do things and to plan ahead a little bit. Whereas with four players, each player gets very few turns and it doesn't feel quite as fulfilling. It's, it's a nice puzzly aspect to try to build up your garden because you're, you're trying to balance kind of two separate things. Obviously, you want to make these um, regions or these sets of, of multiple icons of the same color um, so that you get the scoring tiles. And the scoring tiles are what win you the game, of course. But at the same time, if you focus too much on that, your garden can be kind of small, kind of narrow. And so even an otherwise useless tile for you right now in terms of getting those icons can still be use useful for expanding your garden. Although there are some cards that have icons on opposite corners, so you can't use those to expand your garden. But it's just a, there's a variety of cards and there's a variety of tiles. Um, I really like the variety of, of scoring tiles. So you have some tiles which you only need two to maximize their scoring. And the first tile gives you almost half the points, and the second tile gives you a little bit more. And there are some where the first tile gives you one, and the second one gives you like 12 or 15, right? But there are tiles that are like, oh, you score one for the first tile, but if you get four, you get 20, right? But there's a, there's a wide range of different scores. So it was a really nice variety. And there's the extra tiles, of course, that for some of them that give you that uh, little extra bonus. And it just makes, there's just the right amount of variety in tiles and how they score um, to, to really, that, that part really stands out for me. Um, because there's lots of variety in tiles and each one scores in, in not different ways, but in different kind of ranges, right? They'll always score more the more you get, but... Sometimes they score very little at first, and they score a lot later, and sometimes they score you a lot early, and they score you just a little bit more later. And sometimes you need a lot, and sometimes you need a little. So it's, a, it's a, just a nice variety. And of course, you're trying to build these, these icons, right? Now, if you, if you have three icons next to each other and you put down a temple, then you'll get one tile from the first row. If you instead make it uh, of size four or size five, you get to pick from the first two rows or all three rows. And if you do six or more, then you get a random tile plus any of the tiles that are face up. And so what you usually see, from my experience, is that players will either usually just go for the groups of three and just get the, the low-hanging fruit but try to get many of them, or they can go for the, the big groups of, of six or more, uh, which help you you'll get as many as you do for three because you get two tiles, but one is your choice of any, any of the six that are face up and one is completely random. Um, both work. If you focus on the former, then you're only getting the tiles that are available in the first row and tiles don't shift down. 
So you're kind of reliant on the luck of the draw uh, in, in what tiles will appear in that row. And you can curse kind of the bad luck, like, oh, I needed a blue tile, but a blue tile didn't show up in that first row, right? Um, but when you go through that strategy, you are relying on the luck a little bit. It's still worthwhile, especially at the beginning of the game, you don't really know which tiles to collect, right? But you're, you're going to get whatever. And then later on in the game, then you're shooting for particular tiles, right? You say, oh, I really, I have three of these tiles, but I really want that fourth. And that fourth is in the fifth row, sorry, the third row. So I'm going to try to build a set of five so I can get that tile. But hey, you know, if I could just get one more, six, then I can get that tile plus a free random one, right? And so it's always pushing you a little bit to try to do a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, uh, depending on where you are in the game. Beginning of the game, doesn't matter so much. You're getting whatever tiles come your way. But then as you get tiles, you'll know what you're kind of going for, right? And then, then later on in the game, you'll try to kind of be a little bit more focused, aim toward getting particular tiles. But in the end, it is a lot of it is up to the luck as to where the tiles appear. Um, but it does make for kind of an exciting finish, right? It's like, oh, I'm really hoping to get that last blue tile that I need, and I didn't get it. Okay, I can curse the bad luck, but also that was kind of a fun and exciting ending. So it doesn't bother me at all, and keep in mind, it is a light game that is over in 45 minutes, so um, you always get people that complain about the, the lack of strategy or the strong luck element in a game like that, but just consider this game as a different genre of game, right? Um, some games have a large luck element and some don't. And if you don't like luck, there are lots of games for you. You can play abstract strategy games, for example, if you want to, if you really want to minimize that luck. Um, but for what it is, that style of game, just the sort of family-friendly couples game, uh, I think it's a really great one. The components are straightforward. They're kind of simple. Um, you know, the temples, temple pieces, the only wooden pieces are fine. Uh, the start player marker is this little flimsy uh, bush, I guess, a little cardboard bush that you kind of fit in like that. Uh, it tends to fall apart, but you can glue it. Um, the artwork on the cards is very minimal. So there's most of the card space is taken up by just blank which they represented here as, as beige. I actually would have preferred kind of a, a greener, more lush default. So you really get that feel of the gardens, right? Um, and there's the four icons, the four colors, but the icon is repeated on every card. It does make it clear, really makes it stand out. Um, but yeah, they could have done a little bit more. Maybe if they ever reprint this, make a new version of this, uh, I would definitely like to see an improvement in that aspect. The tiles have nice art, I guess, but not really as important for those. Could just be numbers. You're not really looking at them. You collect them, you put them face down. It doesn't really matter what they look like. So I would have kind of preferred to be a little bit more evocative, but it is clear and it it is a little bit interactive. The clarity helps with that interaction because especially when you're playing with few players, like two players, for example, you can see the other player's garden and you can see what they need. So you can see like, oh, they're, they're really trying to build like a big green area. Well, I can, based on my choice, I can choose which cards will be left for that player and I can take the green ones. Maybe they're okay for me, right? If there isn't a card that's obviously best for me, I can take one that I know is better for you to keep you from getting it. So it has that interactivity. And when you have that interactivity, then you want the, the board to be kind of clear and stand out. In a two-player game, the, the, the board, if you want to call it that, the, the garden that a player is making can become very wide and sprawling. Um, and the icons really pop out, stand out. But yeah, it's not really evocative. Um, if, for a game called The Hanging Gardens, I would expect a more lush presentation. So this is the board, right? Pretty straightforward. They didn't have to put anything on the back, uh, but they did choose to put a scoring track. Um, it took me a while to get used to this. I mean, it's better than having nothing at all, but I don't know about you, but the fact that the tens are over here and the ones are over here is really a bizarre choice to me. Um, <laughs> if this was reversed, it would be much more clear. Okay, 62, okay, six, two, right? And But I can use it. And like I said, it's better than using a piece of paper, I suppose, or is it? 
That's uh, that's a subjective opinion. <laughs> um, this game is a little bit hard to find now. So are there any games that are a little bit more recent, a little bit more contemporary, uh, that fill that same niche? Um, there is one that, or two, I guess if you count a sequel, that does have a similar look and play uh, style to it. And that's a game called Honshu and its sequel, Hokkaido. Um, I haven't played the sequel, Hokkaido. I'm hoping that that's a little bit more to my liking because Honshu left me just a little bit cold. And the reason I think, so it has the same idea, right? It has the idea of you're getting cards and you're playing them. Honshu has a little bit more of a, a game attached to it, right? It has like um, things, uh, different icons on the board score in significantly different ways. You not only can place cards on top, but you can also tuck them under, so you get a little bit more flexibility. And there's a whole kind of aspect of having, I guess, factories or something and the resources they need and making sure you have enough cubes. But the in-between part of exchanging cards is this weird auction-like thing which just felt really, for lack of a better word, gamey. It didn't feel natural. It was one of those things that you can't just explain and then everybody gets it. You explain it and then people go, okay, I, I guess I get it. But what your strategy is doesn't really become evident until you play it once or twice and then you can kind of get a feel for it. But it doesn't feel natural, if that makes any sense. Um, so I'm hoping, because uh, Hokkaido, the sequel, apparently does away with that does a maybe does a more simple uh, draft mechanism so i'm very curious to try that one it doesn't replace hanging gardens for me hanging gardens is a bit more family friendly it is a bit more straightforward to teach it is still wonky in places because you do have to kind of explain the idea of that you can't place cards on top of temples so where you put the temple is kind of important you know ex you don't want to expand uh, an area that already has a temple because you don't really get any benefit for that so some of these things can be a little bit weird to explain, um, but less so than Honshu, uh, which I feel is is a cool game, but it's not one that I actively want to play. Whereas in the case of Hanging Gardens, my wife uh, has asked to play this lots and lots of times, and I always agree. And every time I play it, I enjoy it. And that's pretty much the the, the best thing I can say about the game, right? Is is even after so many plays, the game isn't tiring for me. I, I'm, I haven't, maybe I've kind of explored everything there is in terms of strategy. Maybe I've reached that upper limit. But even having reached that limit, the act of playing it out and going after particular tiles is still a lot of fun, uh, even after so many plays. So uh, it's been a real hit for uh, me and my wife. Uh, great, great couples game. And I would recommend it. Now it is, Hard to find now, uh, from my understanding. So, like I said, if you want kind of a game with a similar feel to it, you could try Honshu. I would almost recommend you check out the sequel, Hokkaido, although I can't actually recommend it because I haven't played it. Those games are, are newer, they're easier to find, they're obviously going to be cheaper because they're not out of print and hard to find like this one is. Um, and they're much smaller boxes, too. Uh, but Hanging Gardens works really well for me. This is a game that is never leaving our collection. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like the Hanging Gardens don't stop being good just because new games come out. Take care.